Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, well, Teamwork for Success, the Parent-Professional Relationship. This webinar is being brought to you by Competence and Confidence, Partners in Policymaking, Family Leadership, and is sponsored by the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University. Funding for our project comes from the Pennsylvania Developmental Disabilities Council. I'd like to, t my name is Kathy Miller and I am the Director of Supports and Services here at the Institute on Disabilities. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we fondly refer to as C2P2 Family Leadership, an inclusive education for non-traditional schools. This project is designed for families of students with disabilities who are educated in home schools, cyber charter schools, charter schools, private schools, as well as parochial schools. The goal of the project is to create a network of family leaders who will work together with educators and administrators to champion inclusive practices for children with disabilities in this non-traditional school community. Our project activities include online leadership development training, such as the webinar this evening, free to you one-on-one -on -one parent consultation support that is provided by trained parent consultants, from Pennsylvania's Education for All Coalition, as well as online resources, which you will be able to find on our website. We will definitely give you that information shortly. So again, tonight I'm delighted that we're having Teamwork for Success, the Parent Professional Relationship, and we have two of our very talented uh, Pennsylvania's Education for All Coalition, otherwise known as PEAT, uh, Dynamite Parent Consultants, Linda Carmona Bell, and Diana Neary, who will be presenting the information to you very shortly. Um, I want to let you know that this project has been in, uh, going on for about the past 18 months, and we have some archived webinars that we've already produced that you are able to go to our website and uh, look at. The first one is Creating a Vision for Your Child's Future. Tim Grusel did that for us, and it's an excellent piece. The second webinar that you will be able to find in our archive section on the webinar is inclusion, supporting all abilities of students learning together. And once again, we had our uh, collaborators from Pennsylvania's Education for All Coalition, Diane Perry, Karen Salomon, and Natalie Weeders, uh, who were presenting that wonderful information. So if you're wondering what inclusion is and want to find out a little bit more about that, please feel free to go to our website and find out about that. Last but not least on our archived webinar page is your child's rights. Learn the laws, rules, and regulations to support your child's education. We were very fortunate to have Maura McElerney, who is a senior staff attorney from the Education Law Center, give us a very uh, great overview on uh, what those laws, rules, and regulations are in the, the various non-traditional school settings. So uh, that, as well as some accompanying um, information on all of those subjects, is available on our website. And to access this archived webinars, the webinars, you can go to the following webpage. Um, so there it is, right there, and we will have this available to you. We will be sending everyone a copy of this PowerPoint um, immediately after the session this evening, or actually tomorrow morning. So look uh, for that in your email. I want to talk a little bit about the wonderful one-on-one -on -one parent consultation that is available to you by being part of C2P2 Family Leadership. Um, as I said before, we have free one-on-one -on -one parent consultation is available through the project. So families participating in our training who, are re who request guidance and technical assistance will be matched with parent consultants from Pennsylvania Education for All Coalition. So you may be asking, what is it that the parent consultants will be able to uh, provide to you? What uh, some of the areas that they are um, are expert have expertise in and will be able to provide consultation to you would be locating resources and supports, helping you understand your child's rights. Perhaps they would uh, you would like someone to review your child's individual education plan or evaluation report. These are family members who have children with disabilities themselves 
and they are really um, very well versed and will be able to provide you with some strategies to support your child's inclusive education, giving you some suggestions and ideas for accommodations and supports for your child's specific needs. Um, if you would like and if a person is available, they can attend your child's individual education plan meeting, the IEP meeting, and they're also available to help you during those transition times from early intervention transitions to secondary trans transitions. So those are just uh, some of the things that are available to you from these uh, wonderful parent uh, consultants. Um, so how is this done? Support can be offered in person, over the phone, or via email, whatever's needed, whatever is most convenient to you as a family member. And again, to request a parent consultant, there's a very simple form. You go to our project website, which again, the address is right here, and complete a form, and we will be providing you with a um, parent consultant. Another thing that I talked about very briefly is that we have online resources. And one way to get some of the resources and to be able to chat with one another about some of the, the issues that you may be having with your child in his or her educational setting is by joining our um, C2P2 Family Leadership Facebook. Um, it is a closed group, which means that you need to go to this website that's here on your screen, which you will have in writing after the presentation, and just to request that you become a member of the Facebook. No one is ever denied, so you just go on and do that. Again, we, we want to keep some confidentiality so um, and make it a safe and secure place, so that's why it is a closed group. So you just uh, click on Join Group, and your request should be accepted within a few days, and then you would be able to post and read some of those comments. Um, we have a very uh, another wonderful and well-informed parent who is our who works for the Institute on Disabilities as our family education coordinator, Kathy Rachia Meyer. And uh, for any other questions about the project, here's all Kathy's uh, contact information, and she will be happy to help guide you through this any of these processes. So. Before we begin the webinar, I just have a couple of housekeeping items. When you have a question tonight, please type your question in the chat box, which you can find on the lower right portion of your screen. And one other thing, we realize that some people may be using their smartphone to listen to this webinar. And um, in order for you to ask the question, if you do have access to email, if you send, uh, you can send an email or, excuse me, a question to me via email at this um, email address, very simple one, millerk at temple.edu, and um, I will get that on my phone and we will address your question at the appropriate time. So, um, another very important thing, as I mentioned earlier, that this project is funded by Pennsylvania's Developmental Disabilities Council. And we are very, um, we're, we want to give them good feedback that, um, and want to hear from you what you thought about this uh, webinar this evening. So if you would please just take a few moments to complete a brief evaluation. It's done on SurveyMonkey. Here again is the, um, the address for the evaluation. So it's really important, number one, to hear from you. And if you, you know, want to suggest any changes, we always listen to families um, and what it is that you uh, would like from us. But we also want to show that our funders that, um, that you've uh, gotten some good information from our webinar. So uh, thank you very much for paying attention to that. And I'm going to now turn the program over to Linda, so please go ahead, Linda, Ramona Bell, take it away. Thank you so much, Kathy. I appreciate the introduction. My name is Linda Carmona Bell, and I'm a PEAK parent consultant. PEAK is an organization of parents, higher education, and school district professionals, self-advocates, and other professionals that support students in inclusive settings in their neighborhood school. We work with parents where they are. I'm a mother of four. My youngest, who's 13 now, has brought me on this journey. 
And I just want to tell you a little bit that this training was actually a product of a collaborative effort between my school district and our higher education partner. We had a district administrator, a guidance counselor, parents, and our higher ed partner as a team. And I'm presenting this with my friend Diana here. Diana? Thank you, Linda. I'm Diana Neary, and I'm really happy and grateful to be here tonight to talk about teamwork for success, the parent professional relationship. I'll tell you a little bit about myself first. I'm a parent consultant with Pete. I have been for a little over two years. And uh, what brought me into Peak is my oldest son, John, who is now 30 years old, is on the autism spectrum. And uh, we've had quite a journey in those 30 years. And I also have a second son, Jeff, who's 25. My background also um, has given me a lot of passion around this topic of teamwork for success. Since I've been a teacher for over 20 years, I taught high school for 15, and the last five years, I was a special ed teacher on the middle school level. So as I tell my friends, I've, I've had the experience of what it feels like on being on the front side of the desk and behind the desk and having both roles, both as a parent and a professional. Right now, I'm retired, so I'm doing more work with Peak, and I'm really enjoying this process. So let's take a look at our presentation for tonight. What are our goals and expectations? Well, when we talk about successful teamwork, the word collaboration comes up. So we want to understand what is collaboration and what a collaborative team environment looks like. What are the components? We also have a second point here to understand the components of working effectively in a collaborative team. What are these components? What do they look like? And finally, to increase collaboration skills that will foster positive family school relationships. So we hope that from this presentation, you can take away skills and tools that will help you get along better. You're here because you have a child who has special needs and you're part of an IEP team, that you can learn different skills, get different ideas to uh, work creatively with your IEP team. And if you're an administrator or a teacher, I hope that you also will gain skills in how to work with families. Okay, so what is collaboration? Take a minute just to think about what you think this word means. What words do you associate with the word collaboration? Because this is an important component of how teams are to work together, how people are to work together on teams. When I think about the word collaboration, what hit me is the word labor is contained in it. And uh, when I think of labor, someone who labors, they're really working very hard. And so when you think of the definition for collaboration, you think of a group of people who work together, where the act of working together, coming together, to create something, to, to uh, create and, and um, work toward a common goal. So collaboration is a key component to a successful team. So we're going to give you a little assignment here. Think about when you were on a team, when you were involved with a group and you had to collaborate. Think about a situation when you had to collaborate. What did you do right and what did you do that you thought was wrong? Uh, it could be an IT team kind of a situation. It could be uh, at your work, your place of work. It could be with a church group, with your community group. Just think about and jot down when you worked with the group and if you collaborated. Think about your actions and uh, jot it down because you're going to need to hold this memory for later on in our training. And we'll give you a few minutes maybe just to think, write down a few thoughts about this. Again, the outcome does not need to be positive or negative. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be a positive situation or a negative. Just anything that you can think of when you work with a group. I hope you have something to write on. Okay, this will be important later on. 
All right, why collaborate? Why are we talking so much about collaboration? Well, we need that for a successful team. We need that to meet in, in our, in our uh, process here as people who are involved in IEP teams. We need to meet, we need to meet the needs of the students. And when we think about our organization peak, our mission is full inclusion for the student in their neighborhood school with positive support. So as we look at why collaborate, we know that through the work of collaborative teams, students with disabilities can be fully included. So collaboration is a key component for inclusion. And when we talk about inclusion, and this has been my experience as well, it's not just within the school day and within the academic subject. We're talking about extracurricular activities, events, clubs, field trips, bake sales. What we're looking for is collaboration within the team so that students can be included in, in every possible way. And we know that this is not an easy process. And I want to share a story. I Now that I'm retired, I substitute teach. And uh, I was in, uh, I often sub in special ed. That's what I like to do. And I was in an autistic support class. The teacher had been out. And the aides were very upset one morning because there was a special fifth grade movie that the entire fifth grade had been planning for a week because it was a half day of school. This was a special activity. And our students in our class, autistic support, weren't invited. They weren't even aware of this. And the aides were upset. So, and this is again a good example of everybody on the team, these were the aides, went to find the teachers and asked them, could they please bring the students in to be included in this movie, which went on for about two to three hours, and would it be all right? And obviously it was, and it was a success, and the students were just thrilled because mostly they're pulled out and they're in a self-contained classroom. So this gave them an opportunity to be with their peers. But for me, it was another reminder that when we think something is really obvious and kids are going to be included, uh, that's not always the case. So we need to work through differences, find areas of agreement, uh, really keep our our ear to the ground so that we know what's, what's uh, happening so that uh, we get and we meet this ultimate goal of inclusion and meaningful participation for the student. So, effective inclusion involves the collaboration and communication, which we need to talk, we will talk about later in this presentation, among the teachers, the family members, administrators, paraeducators, and aides, and, and the community. Uh, and we don't forget the guidance counselors. It, it involves a number of people that need to work together and speak and communicate so that uh, students are successfully included. I like the graphic on the slide because it shows you, uh, it looks like a skull. And if you've ever seen the skulls on the schoolgirls, they, they are in tandem. They are in sync. And they're working together. You don't have one guy rowing on one side at a different level or place than the other person. And that's what we want to try to achieve for a positive experience uh, for our students and for uh, a successful team. All right. So what is a collaborative team? We'd like to show you a short film called For the Birds. It's from 2001. And it's an Academy Award winner. It's a short animated film. And I'll just describe what you'll see. Uh, it starts out with a group of fluffy little birds on a, uh, on a telephone line. And they're very happy chirping away. And all of a sudden, a very large, awkward bird shows up. And they react to this. So I'd like you to watch this film and see what happens.
Okay, I apologize. I think maybe the sound didn't come through, but because it's an animated film, I think that you got the gist of the story of what was happening with these small, cute little birds who then saw this awkward big bird and then decided to move in on him. Um, so we're looking at what is a collaborative team. And uh, a collaborative team has a common language. In this case, the, uh, the little birds did a lot of nonverbal communication, eye contact, noises, uh, it was both verbal and nonverbal. They also uh, had a common goal, and that was to really um, get rid of this large bird, and they were very, very mean-spirited about what they did, although at the end, the joke was on them. So sometimes collaboration can be mean-spirited and ineffective. And certainly from our presentation tonight, what we're trying to do is uh, help us learn tools so that teams are more positive and supportive. I would like to share a story about my son here um, because uh, I had both positive and negative experiences. And in this case, uh, when we talk about mean-spirited, I like to share a story about what happened to him at the end of fifth grade. Um, at that point in time, John was going to transition to middle school, and he was having a very difficult time. He was very upset with compulsive. He had started taking medicine, and things were just not working out with the school district. Uh, so at the end of fifth grade, when he was going to transition to middle school, the supervisor of special ed said to me, uh, I'm sorry, but we just don't have a program for John. There is no program for him at the middle school. And I was very distraught because he was so hard at that time to handle. And I didn't know really where to turn. And I was trusting the school district to give me the proper advice. What they came up with was to send him to an approved private school or what we call an APS. Um, they kept telling me this would be the best placement, John would do well, and that really when he stabilized and was doing better, they'd bring him back to our school district. Well, unfortunately, the experience at that school was very negative. He was uh, restrained, put in timeout rooms, 
punished for his disability and really uh, very, very affected negatively and has very low self-esteem from this and probably got uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. The point of me telling this story is the supervisor of special ed never considered any other alternative. Obviously, what I know now is that John could have done middle school with an aide with the proper support and stayed in our neighborhood district. But that didn't happen. And it took a lot of hard work and grunge and support from an advocate to get him back out of that school and into uh, our neighborhood school. But I, I share the story because that for me was like an example of a collaborative team that was mean spirited. And my experience now is that I wish I had had the courage to disagree with them at the time, but I was trusting their judgment. And uh, all this did turn out better, but at that point in time, it was very difficult. So what I'd like you to do is think about a collaborative team. Think about it and what it is not. And please, if you would, jot down your thoughts in the chat area. Uh, we'd love to hear what you're thinking and what your experience has been when you've had an, uh, an experience with a team that's not being collaborative and not being cooperative. So we'll wait to see some. Oh, thank you. This is from Allison. Not working toward a negative outcome. Great. And Kathy, just testing. Okay, just testing, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> one-sided, yeah. Very one-sided from my experience. Great. From Susan, not using first-person language. Great. I love it. I agree. Bullying or being aggressive. I felt bullied. I felt like it was the Spanish Inquisition when I would go in me against them. Untimely with sharing information so that you don't have what you need when you're in a meeting where it comes too late. These are all great examples here. All right, thanks for your, your input. This is really helpful. So what we have come up with is a few, a few items. A collaborative team is not a bully pulpit. There's not one person who bullies through and tells everybody else what to do. And that was my experience with that special ed supervisor. She brought in people from the IU and everybody agreed. Um, it's not a dictatorship monopolizing conversation where someone just speaks and monopolizes and doesn't give anybody else a chance. A closed-minded form without hearing and listening to one another. You don't just want to be listened to in a meeting, you want to be heard. And it's not where multiple people speak at the same time. Uh, everybody should have a chance to speak and be listened to and be heard. Thanks for all the input on this. and. Uh, what I'd like to do now is move back to Linda, who's going to talk about a video that she brought showing some collaboration on a team at her daughter's school. Thank you, Diana. I want to talk about a little bit about this video. It's a collaborative team, actually within the school, in my school district. You're going to see the team at work. You're going to hear some of the things that started the collaboration, and you're going to see some of the results of the collaboration. And as you view the video, please make note of specific examples of collaboration. Also, note ways that you have used these skills that you see in working with your team. Three years ago, I started at James Buchanan Elementary School and what we did in the second year was close down two of our full-time learning support classes. And those teachers were going into the regular classroom, doing some pull-out, and we found the children to be just as successful as they had before, if not more successful. In year three, what we did was we closed down yet um, the third um, learning support class, and that was a first and second grade class. We closed that down. Again, all of the children were included. 
The key, though, is that we kept the level of support. So the children were not just included, but that special education teacher, the teaching assistant, all were there to support the students in the regular education classroom. In year three, we've also included our emotional support children in grades kindergarten, first, and second. Again, that also is working out surprisingly well. I also think, to go back to the original story, is the com open communication with the parents. And that continues with, um, as I said, Mrs. Cremona Bell. And it's really a model for us to follow with other parents who have struggled with having their children included in the regular ed or general education classrooms. Our teachers accept that these are our students, that they will do the job, they excel at doing the job, and we're very proud of our staff here. This is a typical day in our research lab. We do it every single day for a full hour. All students are included. Um, we, get, we begin the lesson as a whole group. Students do independent reading for 15 minutes. They go choose their own books on their level. They know what their reading zone is, what things they can read from. After they're done reading, we go into sharing what's something interesting that they learned. We write a wow well fact. Then we break into our level groups, which follows the RTI model um, of benchmark strategic and intensive. Intensive students work with the special ed teacher at the back table, getting support for drafting their books. Strategic groups, they work back here with me. I get them started, I let them go, and then I go back to my benchmark group as they're working independently and see what help they need. Then I come back and check on the group. And this is an everyday daily basis. An opportunity came my way to participate in the C2P2 Early Intervention Program, which was run out of um, Temple University. And it was specifically to empower parents um, to learn more about early intervention. Well, since my daughter was in the process of nearly transitioning, I was still accepted, which became actually an invaluable experience because one of the key components of that program was that it taught you the value and the techniques for developing a vision for your child. And in addition to that, it also provided a framework for the concept of inclusion. So basically, through all the um, trials and tribulations that we've had in trying to figure out what an environment is, an inclusive environment is for my child, I come away with three things. One is that there is no such thing as getting a child ready for the classroom, but rather the classroom getting ready for my child. And instilling that concept in every teacher that she's going to meet from here until she's out of school. The second component is that the team is critical to the success. And I mean working as a team, collaborating as a team. Um, constantly being proactive as a team and not reactive. And the third thing is just to being persistent and persevere with my vision because that is what everyone has to see from now and again until she's out of school and actually beyond because my vision takes me until she's an adult and out of my house. So those three items I think are, are the three most critical components to for me, for a successful environment. Um, the the uh, slide, I mean, the movie would have shown that the school had decided to collaborate. And I'll just basically tell you my story. Um, when I came into the school district, the school was not at all um, accepting of students with significant disabilities in inclusive settings. And so what I kept hearing um, at the time was that my daughter, Sienna, was not ready. She just was not ready to be included. She wasn't ready for kindergarten. That's even possible, since so kindergarten has such a wide range of skills. But um, so we, we had to collaborate in order to for them to kind of embrace inclusion based on the vision that I had for inclusion. And this actually leads us nicely into the next slide, which says basically that everyone on the team has a valuable contribution to make to that team and to support um, my child. And so the fact that the parent 
knows the child best and that the parent should share that information every time someone thinks that um, they know what's best for the child. The parent should always express and share those things that they know about their own child. In my case, my, my child has a communication uh, barrier, so it's very difficult for her to express herself fluently, even though she does express herself. And you kind of get it after a while, but if you don't know her, people tend to think that her lack of communication is directly linked to her cognitive skills, as if she cannot think because she cannot speak as well. Um, I always say that they tend to talk loudly and slowly to her, and she looks at them and doesn't understand exactly. Um, at this point, she gets very sarcastic in her way when someone does that, and she pretty much ignores them, regardless of who they are. Um, so the team had to work together very closely to develop these inclusive settings for her, especially since she has these uh, difficulty in communication. The collaborative team, in most cases, is often the IEP team, and it includes the teachers and your family members, the administrators, related services, support personnel, paraeducators, community resources, and of course, the student. I have to add to that and say that our team actually included our cafeteria workers, it included our bus drivers, and it included our maintenance staff. Because in terms of accommodations, they always go to the maintenance staff. So if they're your friends and they understand my child, those accommodations go much smoother. They also bridge the gap. Um, in the summer, when we visit the school, and we always visit our school, even if it's a new school, we always visit the summer. During the summer, we build those relationships with the maintenance staff because they're going to be there all year. The administrative secretaries and the support staff, we build those relationships. And they know her when she's coming into the school. And they see her around, and that really builds um, her comfort level in the school. And that is um, a part of our collaborative. They will always be part of our collaborative team. Who should be on the team? You, you think about those things. We think of an IEP team and we think of, you know, the teacher, um, sometimes the, the principal or some administrator. We think of your related service and support personnel. But maybe there's some other people in that expanded, uh, in that expanded area of, that needs to be part of your team. How many members are there on the team? Um, is anyone missing currently from, from that IEP team that you think should be there and should be at those meetings? Those are some of the considerations. When we're talking about part of the IEP team and, and the people who are present, um, it doesn't count if the person gets up and leaves in the middle of the meeting, um, if the person needs to be there. So that's we have to make note of that. That's the time when you call for another IEP meeting because you really need some of the players at the table, especially um, if there are some issues, some big issues that really have to discuss, that have to be discussed. So the meeting can be organized as part of the collaborative process. Is the meeting can be organized around schedules. It can be organized so that people come in and out based on when they need to be heard. But also be aware that there are times when everyone needs to hear the whole story. Um, my IEP team meets in the summer, and I mean everybody, meets before school begins in a library or cafeteria or somewhere where we just hear the whole story. So we hear about what's to be expected, what, what are the goals, and more importantly, what the vision of inclusion is. Because that vision could be different in the eyes of um, everyone. And so, you know, as we move on and talk about some of the components of a collaborative team, that thing and shared vision that you will hear throughout this whole presentation is so critical. So now we ask, what about the role of each team member? Well, everyone on the team actually has a specific role, and it's very important that they understand the strengths and value the talents of each of the individual members on the team. They need to share responsibilities, and I say that specifically even with, between the parent and the teacher. It's a, it's kind of a village atmosphere. Everyone uh, share, can share in the responsibility of meeting the goal. The specific goals have to be identified and filled. So, for example, you can't say that there's a vacancy right now in that position, so that person, um, you know, can't be there. Well, we have to fill it. What are we going to do as a team to make sure 
that that vacancy is filled. And sometimes that happens, I know in my district, that happens a lot in terms of support personnel and related services. Sometimes a speech therapist is not available or an OT is not available. Well, what do we do as a group to make sure that that vacancy is filled because that has to be done? Um, and it's voluntary. It's important that people are there, and I was going to say because they want to be there, but sometimes people may not 100% want to be there, but they need to be there, and they know they need to be there. Once everyone's roles are identified, they understand their purpose, and their purpose at that meeting That's very important. So think about which strengths do you bring to the team. Whatever your position is and whatever you do in, your, in the district and on that IEP team, what are the strengths? What are you bringing to that, to that team? For parents, as I said before, you know your child best. So you bring that expertise of your child, how your child learns, or even what your child likes to do, and how that can be incorporated into the classroom setting. We have a handout that's going to be part of this uh, presentation that's going to be on the website. And the handout is, talks about these different characteristics of collaborative teams. It goes through some very key components, seven specific components of what uh, a collaborative team really must have. And I'm not going to go through this in detail now. We'll talk about some of the highlights, some of the key pieces, which is on this slide. Again, the mutual goals, we'll say that a lot. Everyone has to buy into the same goal within a particular framework of similar beliefs. And that belief, the very core of the belief for an inclusive setting is that definition of inclusion. It requires parity among participants. So sometimes there's power plays, and sometimes people feel they have more power over another person. But that's not going to be a very good collaborative team if one person feels they have um, much more uh, of a say than another. It depends on shared responsibility for participation and decision making. And I say decision making because sometimes I hear um, in, in teams that they will say, oh, well, the ultimate decision is up to the district or the ultimate decision is up to the principal. And when we're talking about this, this shared decision making, the decision is really everyone because it is a team. So everyone has to agree. Requires shared responsibility for outcomes when things go right and when things go wrong. That shared responsibility is important. And in my experiences, we've had um, incidences on both sides where things have gone very wrong. And people have taken responsibility for that. And we've tried to make those corrections. But then things also go uh, very well. And we have to always acknowledge those who, who have done good jobs that we can pat on the back and say that was a great thing that was done. In my case, one of the things that was in the video is the principle that we had at the time. And our principle was a critical component of ensuring that an effective inclusive program happened at our school district. She was the one who was the, really the mover and the shaker to make things happen in that school. And um, a lot of what has happened in that school to date where they have removed several self-contained classrooms and they have um, co-teaching throughout that in that particular school. That was attributed to the, to the principal who now retires, but it continues because her vision continues. It requires that participants share their resources. And again, I bring out the fact that parents usually have so many resources that teachers and principals and administrators can all tap into and reflects a voluntary relationship, a relationship where people do this because they understand their purpose and they want to be there. One of the snapshots of this entire idea of collaborative teaming is this infographic that has all the components. And some of the components, other components that weren't on the previous slide, shared accountability, shared, um, shared resources, shared goals, some of those pieces uh, are also very important characteristics. And the bottom right also has emerging trust and respect. And we'll talk a little bit more about trust a little later on, but that is very much a key component. 
So collaborative teaming, the most important feature of a collaborative team, shared decision making as they work towards that common goal, big picture goal, successful inclusion. That could be a very big goal, but you have small goals too. Maybe the goal is to ensure that your child can read and write their name or write it in cursive. And, you know, those are smaller goals, but those are key goals as well. Um, when we're talking about establishing a common goal essential to successful success, successfully meeting the needs of a student, if we're talking about full inclusion and we're talking about having a student totally socialized with their peers, um, some people, again, in terms of the definition, I think full inclusion would be pulling out the student for reading and writing in a self-contained room, or pulling out the student for their services um, throughout the day, or uh, pulling the student out for whatever they think the student would need more intense work on. You know, that there are reasons why that happens and there are models where that happens. Um, but again, if it's for full inclusion, the team can come together and figure out how that pullout doesn't have to happen as often or at all. People work together to achieve those goals. Now, the reality is that some teams have conflict. That is an absolute reality. You won't always agree. Conflicts occur for different reasons. Um, in my case, in the beginning, a conflict that I had mentioned was that Sienna wasn't ready. Now, that's a big conflict because that's what she was. We said she wasn't. So we had to get over that conflict, and it was a matter of really um, – my not backing down and trying to get that, more importantly, to understand my vision of inclusion and to value my vision of inclusion. And once they did that, even though they didn't understand and they didn't agree, they did value and appreciate the fact that that's where I was aiming for her to be 15, 10 years from now on her own, as independent as she possibly can, and they agreed to work towards that in that school. So it is definitely something that is defined as the struggle that occurs when individuals interdependent with others perceive that those others are interfering with their goal attainment. That is a real definition of conflict. And Diana will go into telling you a little bit more about how to collaborate. Uh, I love the characteristics of collaboration. I'm glad that's on the website that people can have that, have their own copy of that. We're talking about conflict, and I sure uh, have already shared stories of all the conflicts that I had with my son, John, as he came through uh, elementary, middle, high school, even college. Uh, but things did do better, and I'd like to share uh, a story about him, how we did collaborate when we had a conflict that illustrates that things can work out, that the, the uh, team is not always mean-spirited, but will work for a common goal. Uh, once I got John, my son John, out of the APS, the approved private school, he was back at our neighborhood middle school and then high school. And uh, because he had had such a negative experience, he was very hyper vigilant about anybody, any interaction with t teachers. He was very sensitive, uh, very suspicious of their motives. He didn't trust anybody. And uh, he was with a learning support teacher who he sent and I knew did not want him there. And he had an aide who also wrote me notes every day and just didn't understand John's disability and just couldn't understand why he wasn't uh, more consistent from day to day. So Johnny did what a lot of kids do. He went to bed, wouldn't leave his room. I couldn't get him out of bed or to school. And I was distraught because after all the battles I had fought with the APS, I finally got him where I thought he, he belonged, and then he didn't want to go to school. So what did they do? What did this district do? Because it was a new district. And to his credit, the supervisor of special ed called a, a very small meeting with me and the life skills teacher and himself. And his question to me was, what do we need to do to get Johnny back to school? And I almost fell off the chair because no administrator had ever talked to me that way, somebody who was thinking about John's needs over everyone else. So I said, I said, well, 
the learning support teacher doesn't want him there. She's letting me know that. She doesn't think he's in the right place, and she doesn't want to help him uh, create friendships. And the aid's not working, and so we need to get a new teacher. And what happened was uh, we had the life skills teacher take over John's uh, IEP and uh, oversee his whole program. Um, I thought this was good because this was a teacher. I know this is a cliche, but she did think out of the box, and she understood the disability. But then we had another problem because Johnny did not want to get near the life skills room. He was going to be college-bound, and he didn't feel like that was the right place for him. So, to their credit, uh, his teacher oversaw his program. He didn't go near her room. She checked in with him, and things really worked out. He started to love school. He was... Uh, later, never needed an aid. We did get a new, na new aid that we then let go, and uh, he completed high school with honors and went off to college and just graduated last August uh, from Cabrini College. So it was because these people wanted to listen and collaborate, and they heard me that Johnny's high school years were a success, and all that negative stuff that happened at the APS was kind of left behind. So what we want to look at is how do you collaborate while you acknowledge differences. I knew that the teachers didn't all agree. They knew I didn't agree. And we can use John's story to illustrate. It was more open discussion. I was really admired what the special ed supervisor did by just bringing a small group together to talk and be open, uh, to uh, not hold on to any negative uh, discussion, but to move forward. And we compromised. Uh, I wasn't thrilled that John was had a life skills teacher, but she was the best person for him at that time. So the strategies that we used to collaborate, we clarified our purpose, and that was to get John back to school. What did he need? A new teacher, a new aide, focusing on facts and not personality. We, got, we looked at our options, and it worked out well that we found a way to get him into school and to fully include him, and eventually without an aid. There was no judgments. We brainstormed. We didn't say Johnny was lazy because he wasn't coming to school. We just dealt with the facts. We looked at all our options to meet his needs, and it seemed that we moved forward with that, and we did choose the best fit for him and for me because I was relieved that he went back to school. I wasn't sure what I was going to do if I couldn't get him back in after all the work that we had done to get him back into this regular school district. Well, we know what can go wrong uh, with my situation in particular. Alternatives were not considered carefully. Minority opinions were silent. Nobody was listening to me. The teachers didn't want them. And then the district was able to move beyond that. And there were a lot of disagreements among the staff and the teachers and the aides about John as well. What can go right, and again, my story, I think, can illustrate that. Effective team can stimulate team interest in the students, allow for new instructional ideas. Johnny was fully included in regular classes, chemistry, algebra 2, calculus. This led to a lot of creative problem solving, and I really think that when we are able to creatively problem solve, it's very stimulating and exciting when people come together and think outside the box. We improved decision-making skills. We were building stronger teams and uh, made friends for life with some of the teachers that I still know. And we also created ownership and commitment for our own decisions. And it worked for John. I think now I'm going to turn it back to Linda. And she's going to talk about communication. Okay, so in terms, of, in terms of communication, we know, and we've been saying this entire time, that communication is critical. How are you going to make your vision known? How are you going to make your goals known? How are you going to be able to share all about what you know about the student as a professional, as a parent, as a family member? We know that we have to have active listening. We have to get beyond those egos in that room. We have to empathize and try to understand, and it has to be ongoing communication. 
we use email a lot in my district to communicate to our uh, whether it's the support services or the teachers or the principal. Uh, we do that. So we communicate outside the IEP. The IEP is spent really diving into really important issues where we all need to be around um, each other. If if family members are to be involved as true partners in their children's education, this support is to provide ongoing opportunities to hear their concerns and comments as well as provide them information. Ongoing, not only during the IEP time, but all the time throughout the school year. It's very important. And part of that communication is building trust. We talked about trust earlier in terms of one of the criteria for a collaborative team. Trust is hard to build. It's not intuitive, it's not natural for many of us to trust people just because we communicate with them. So we really have to build this culture of trust. And some of the barriers to trust it could be fear. Um, fear that there's going to be litigation to the district. Fear that there's going to be retaliation against the the child from the family's point of view. It could be emotional, just very much emotional every time you get in and there's conflicts or disagreements and emotions arise. Um, there could just be reasons of people feeling very uh, intimidated or just uncomfortable, not feeling, feeling comfortable enough to talk to each other. So think about how your team has established trust. Think about ways that you have come to get to know each other and to trust each other. One of the key things is honest communication, honestly talking about what you're feeling, your concerns. Um, and if you have concerns about how to put it in a way where you're not offending people or you need to get some words on how to have that meeting, come to Peak. Talk to Peak. We'll help you out. We'll give you that language. We'll talk to the parents and the family. Talk with the professionals. We'll help you bridge those gaps. So, in the beginning, you had that activity where you jotted down some of your, that, um, some of your ideas on a personal situation where you actually had a collaborative issue. I want you to take that out or recall that information and think about that situation a minute. Determine what you like about what you did. Determine what you could have done differently. And think about that for a moment based on all the components that we talked about today. Take a few minutes. Feel free to jot things down in the chat if you want to share. And we want to just tell you that we will surely get to our destination if we join hands. That's an awesome quote that really talks about everyone working together. I just want to mention, too, before we go to questions, that PEAD's website is P-A-E-D for all, P-A-E-D-F-O-R-A-L-L dot org. And we have an upcoming IEP clinic on March 29th at Penn State Abington. And at the IEP clinic, we will talk to families and look at their uh, IEPs and their concerns and give them feedback, and we'll have various professionals there, and it's all free of charge. So feel free to look at the team website. And I'm turning it over to Kathy. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, again, we are open for any questions if anyone wants to um, ask any questions right now. Let's give that a few more minutes. I do uh, apologize for the technical difficulties this evening. Um, technology is great when it works. Sometimes it just um, okay. Oh, okay. Yes, I see that there's a question from Cecilia. Um, Cecilia, yes, the PowerPoint will be available to uh, all the participants. It'll be up on the website tomorrow, so um, you'll be able to download that. And uh, we'll actually send it to folks as well. So we have your contact information. So we'll be sending you that as well as the uh, material that uh, Diana mentioned before. There's a one-pager on collaboration, which is a great fact sheet that will really uh, 
serve as a great guide to um, to you um, is when you're working with teams and uh, working with other folks in your school districts and uh, collaborating with them. So I think that's really great. Um, yes, and I see there's a question from Jen. Um, can you post a link to the YouTube video for the bird? Yes, absolutely, Jen. We'll be happy to do that as well. So uh, it's a great short, and um, I think it would be wonderful. So we can certainly do that as well. So we'll have that. In fact, we'll actually put it up on our website, but we can post a link for that as well. Any other questions? Okay, well, um, I do want to thank our key parent consultants, Diana and Linda. They did a great job. And um, I encourage you all to take a moment to please complete this brief evaluation on SurveyMonkey because uh, we really want to hear from you. Um, I also want to take this moment to um, let you know that um, we will be – this is – concludes our webinars for this particular year. We'll start up again in the fall or perhaps late summer. We'll see how that goes. But we really um, encourage you to continue to social network. If anyone is interested in working with us in determining what uh, webinars we would, we would like to deliver, um, us to deliver for next year, please feel free to contact us because we're looking for some good people who would like to um, join with us and uh, figure that out and decide what kinds of um, what kinds of areas and topics you would like us to uh, to uh, select and to pr uh, do for you. So um, I see that um, people are asking that uh, they want to um, keep keep us e keep emailing um, you about all the information and we will keep doing that throughout the summer and we Certainly, it's not even summer yet. It's not spring yet, is it? So we'll do spring. I'm just forward thinking here because it's been so darn cold, hasn't it been? But um, it's throughout the spring and summer, we will be contacting you. Um, yes, can you put the Survey Monkey link on the chat for us to click? That it, It's actually going to pop up when we close, so that would be really great. There was another question oh, right here. <laughs> Okay, so Sarah's question is, let me repeat that. When should I call a meeting, and how do I turn the attention from removing my child to a, to the fact that um, to get the school district to accept that they belong in the school? So I'm going to take ask our um, experts to answer that. Suggestions from uh, Linda or Diana? Okay, I think... Well, the first question, you should call a meeting whenever there is a concern, whenever there's a concern. You don't have to wait until an annual meeting. You don't have to wait until someone tells you that it's only a certain time during the year. It could be any time that there's a concern. But see, in my case, I think that we need to be proactive also. Any time that you are foreseeing that there may be an issue. So there may not even be an issue at the time, but you want to prepare. You want to be you want to be ready. And so you can call a meeting for that as well. So, and that goes along with how you um, actually help them to understand that your child belongs. It's always having your vision first and letting them always know what the goal is. Um, and then you work with educating people, first of all, in terms of the research, what the research shows, you, you educate them maybe on the law, you educate them on um, just kind of the moral issues, and you educate little by little. And in, in that case, um, one of the things I did initially, it really depends on how, um, how receptive the school district is. When the school district was not receptive at all, I would copy our district attorney on our letters, never reference the attorney, never contacted the attorney, but just would copy the attorney on all our letters so that the attorney was clued in. And it was very interesting how things would turn around um, in my favor for people to listen. But again, that was the extreme. As things got better, 
Um, and as we had pushback, maybe you know, from a teacher or a principal, it's a matter of just educating. I would always put together a packet. I would always go to meet individually. Um, and again, I'm very, you know, open, so they would know exactly how I felt from the beginning and exactly my expectations from the beginning. And it was never an issue of uh, a request for how, um, you know, if I may, it was always, you know, how can it happen? And so it was just based on the approach. I wanted to say something, too. Whenever you feel as though the child's IEP is not being followed and you have concerns, that you should definitely call a meeting. If the child's been restrained, that should be automatically into a meeting. So uh, keeping uh, the, the lines of communication open, uh, when I taught, sometimes we could actually do a revision over a phone. We could do a revision without calling a meeting. So there's a lot of ways that you can uh, connect with the, the teacher and the parent. But I definitely think that... Uh, Make sure that your child's IEP is being followed, the goals are being, there's progress monitoring being taken on the goals and making sure that, you know, you're on top of those things. I see more questions here. As if, what should I bring into a meeting? Boston. Other than a picture of my child. I think um, it, a picture helps, but I also think that you want to bring in uh, or talk about the child's interest, what makes that child uh, check what makes the child happy. Uh, in my case, uh, my son John was a terrific bowler, and we talked a lot about bowling. And uh, we started a bowling club at the high school when he was there. So, uh, Linda, I don't know. Do you, would you bring anything else besides that? Uh, things for your child besides the picture? You mentioned picture before. Isn't it? Uh, one of the things that I always bring at the IEP meeting is um, a, a, an agenda. And I bring an agenda so that we stay on target and, and always address the issues, hopefully, that I need to bring to the table. I also bring, in, in anticipation of questions, I would bring resources. So if someone says, well, I don't understand how your child who's in middle school and don't know how to count 1 to 10, how to work that child into math, and I will immediately have either there's some websites or a handout or, um, you know, an, an article from someone, something, not overwhelming, I don't want to overwhelm the person, but something to share immediately at that point in time. And so um, over the years, I've been able to gather resources. And again, Pete can help you with this. I've been able to gather resources so that I won't overwhelm, but be able to share something with pretty much everyone. Um, who might say that there is a, a problem with them trying to understand how to include my child. The other piece is that when you uh, have a request for an IEP meeting, please put it in writing. It should always be in writing. And it doesn't have to be um, anything that is, um, you know, not cordial. You can be cordial. You can be kind. It can be in writing. Um, email is, is, is in writing. If you want something stronger, then you would put it in writing and you would um, address it to the district and you would hand deliver it and get a signature from the person who you hand deliver it to and a date. And that's something where you have to go. That's um, very important that you do that as well. I was... I was also going to say that the email is considered a legal document, so whatever you write in the email can be. Okay, we can take two more questions. Okay. If the last IP meeting consists of the teacher and the parent, but everything went well, the only we only did an agreement with the OT. Do I need to call another review? If I understand this correctly, uh, you wrote the IEP and then added in uh, OT services. Do I need to call another review? And the consensus is yes. If there's a disagreement with anyone, with any service provider, with any teacher, um, you may not necessarily need to have everyone 
sitting at the meeting to hash out what the issue is. You can hash out what the issue is and then meet to discuss it because some, you don't want to take up um, too much time of, of anyone's time to, you know, talk about things that are not targeted. So if there's a specific issue with the OT, make sure you understand and everybody understands why you're coming to the meeting, and then, yes, we would definitely call a meeting. There's, there's another question here is, um, as a teacher, how do I express my opinion without getting my principal upset? And of course, I was in that position many times because I often was in IEP meetings and I didn't always agree with the the position of the district. And uh, most of the time, I didn't go to the principal. I would talk to my uh, direct supervisor, my special ed supervisor, to share how I felt. But this is a sticky area. And uh, to be perfectly honest, it's one reason why I retired. <laughs> because I, I didn't feel like I could get to, get to the principal, and many times the special ed teachers didn't always agree with my position. Um, I felt that there is a special ed model that teachers come from, and that because I was a parent, I didn't agree. So this is a very sticky issue because jobs are always on the line, and uh, they can easily replace people. Uh, but I do think, and this is, as a parent, what I've learned is you have to follow your heart, Speak from your gut and speak your truth. And uh, if you get in trouble, so be it. We'll get over it. And one of the things I would like to say is if a teacher um, has a particular disagreement, it's usually over something specific with the child. Use the data. If there's data, just talk about the facts. These are the facts. Document the facts. You don't even have to give your opinion most of the time because the data speak for itself. Now, if there's no data, that's another issue. But if you do have data and observation is a bona fide piece of data, as long as you record exactly what you see, what the results are, let that speak for it, and that will open up the conversation. Kathy Miller again. I'm just checking to make sure we have no other. Um, oh, here's another question. Okay. I got so so much more comment uh, from Irene. I got so much more accommodations with a cyber school than public school for my son. He's doing much better in cyber school than public school. That's great to hear. We're really glad that your son is getting. Um, more accommodations, so that's that's a wonderful thing to share. Uh, so that's more of a statement, but here's a question. As a guidance counselor, how can I get this information to parents without stepping over school boundaries? Excellent question. And I'm going to turn that over to our experts as well. In the district that I taught in, I think that the guidance counselor wouldn't have any trouble sharing this information that it wouldn't be seen as a threat um, to bring, uh, have a parent, have a parent consultant and offer advice and support. Um, you know, that th this is really, again, part of what our presentation was about tonight, this collaboration, this communication and trusting. Um, and, and it would be, I think, a good idea to stick your neck out, share the information, and let the chips fall where they may because if we stay stuck, we're never going to move forward, and, and I think sharing is a good idea. Linda, you want to say something, Jennifer? Yeah, I think another thing you can do is you can always share information with the special education, the, however you call this person, either the caseworker or the lead special educator or whoever the person is in that building directly uh, working with that student. I know in our district we call it a caseworker. Um, case management, that type of thing. That person could be the buffer also between you and the parent, whether it's flyers or just resources, websites, anything like that. That's always a good contact person. Well, thank you all so much for uh, being with us this evening. And um, I want to thank our presenters once again. And, and these are the parent consultants from Pennsylvania's Education for All Coalition, PEAK, 
And again, this is a free service to you. Please go on our website. And um, if you would like to have further discussions, a more private discussion where they can really spend time and um, help you address uh, your child's issues that they may be having at, with school. And even if it's not a, a very serious issue, but again, how to include, you know, how to um, get a get the best quality education possible for your son or daughter in in the, in the school district, in the whether it be the cyber school, um, some tips for homeschooling, um, in the you know charter school, in a private school. Um, our peak consultants are really. Um, top-notch and uh, ready to work with you and really figure out solutions uh, to make uh, your child's education the best that it can be. So again, thank you all so much for joining us um, and for, um, and someone, yeah, oh, here we go. I have uh, one more uh, comment from Sarah. Um, as a guidance counselor talking about parent involvement and parent education, encouraging and disseminating uh, Patent trainings, peak, and other community resources to support parents in this process are a win-win. You're so correct, Sarah. Thank you so much because, again, there are so many resources out there, and the system is is a very complex one that we've um, created. So these are folks to help you navigate that system and to really uh, provide ex excellent um, supports for you as you uh, do the best you can for your son or daughter. So thank you so much. When we uh, close this, the uh, Survey Monkey is going to pop up, so please uh, let us know what you thought, and uh, we will be in touch. So you be in touch, okay? Good night, everybody. Take care.